Ramesh, thank you very much for having us at Cal IT2 or the sure. Qualcomm Institute. Let me uh, just, just do the generic thing and give you an opportunity, if you would, wouldn't mind, to share with us the extraordinary research and very diverse research. So you, we were at Qualcomm yesterday uh, and hearing about one of your uh, political science professors who's using new technology, mobile technology, to detect fraud uh, in elections in Africa. We, you have others that are working in uh, UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles, i.e. drones, but drones can be the size of a fly. Uh, they can be smaller than the size of a fly. <laughs> uh, you, you've got people working on uh, quantifying uh, the biophysical impacts of meditation. That might be you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, about Cal IT2. So, you know, we were set up uh, 13 years ago as one of four institutes uh, designed specifically to promote science and innovation. And what it did was give us the charter to sort of live outside of the box, combine disciplines in ways, be bold. And so much of it also has to do with financial support. Uh, we were recently named the UCSD division of Cal IT2, which I direct was named the Qualcomm Institute, uh, in honor of about $26 million so far of philanthropic support from the Qualcomm Corporation in support of curiosity-driven research. You know, that's what it takes to empower people to attempt new things like many of the things that you mentioned, Steve. Uh, I think uh, a, a great research campus like UCSD has many brilliant minds, and a little bit of support of this sort enables many things to take, you know, to sprout. So what are some of the, the others? So uh, a lot of the excitement currently is around the brain initiative, mm -hmm. uh, new technologies that will help you figure out how the regions of the brain talk to each other. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about rethinking robotics. You know, we're all familiar with large-scale robots, the million-dollar robots, uh, the self-driving car, the hero projects. But this whole new world of, if I might call it that, consumer robotics, you know, 10 robots in every home. Think of your cell phone as the brain that powers these robots, right? So completely rethinking how we might incorporate technology uh, into our everyday lives. Uh, but th uh, what about our ability to spy on each other? <laughs> so, you know, the, the best response to that is counter-spying. Uh, mm. If uh, these drones become cheap enough, you can fly your own hawk uh, <laughs> to physically obstruct uh, the ones that are attempting to spy on you. Uh, they are spying on you right now through your computer. You know, this is nothing new. Uh, so, uh, new frontiers to explore. You know, uh, looking back 13 years, I think some of the most remarkable things have been uh, what emerged at the intersection of uh, engineering, computer science, and the digital arts, which is a very strong, vigorous presence here, uh, as well as with medicine, right? So it seemed like there are these parts of campus that traditionally have not worked closely, uh, but given an environment in which they're equal citizens, so to say, and have access to facilities, and just a culture which promotes playful explorations, you know, interesting things happen. So you have the arts involved, and I know that when I was here last time, we discussed uh, what was going on in the um, the drones the size of a moth movement, but essentially you had lots of people in the artistic community raising fundamental questions, so they were part of your, your uh, Absolutely. Uh, program For as well. Absolutely, an integral part. Uh, so a lot of the new media spaces are in this part of the building. Uh, we actually have a gallery, there's a new show that's uh, gonna be put on. Uh, and yeah, it's cultivating things at the intersection of the experimental, and both in terms of engagement as well as in terms of building new things, intersection of the arts. Uh, so that gives me a good on-ramp to this notion of consciousness and awareness in this interesting, how many of you were at the Deepak Chopra thing yesterday? See, I'm still um, uh, reeling in this, right? Consciousness, <laughs> awareness. But when I was with uh, Ramesh in his program, and we were talking about drones, you're talking about robotics, and you're also talking, frankly, about uh, the deployment of these uh, cell phones and, and reporters inside uh, you know, Mobuto's uh, government and looking at, at election fraud. So there is a consciousness and awareness uh, as, as Chopra was saying, I still remain on the skeptical wing, despite his best efforts. Um, but we also talked about you and what your research is doing and quantifying bliss. So take us there. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm by training, by profession, an electrical engineer. Uh, but Cal IT2, the 13 years here, has influenced me uh, and gotten me to do things that I didn't think I would be doing. Like becoming a techno hippie. <coughs> yes. Yes. And experimenting on myself uh, in a big way uh, for many years. So, you know, some of these things have no rational explanations, uh, but a few months before I turned 50, which was about five years ago, uh, there came a moment when I said, what am I waiting for? You know, uh, there are all these things I've always wanted to do. I might as well start doing them. And that, for me, meant running, 
I was always running in my mind. I figured I might as well run in real life. Uh, it also meant doing meditation. I grew up in India. We, you hear about meditation, you hear about all sorts of spiritual practices, but I was a skeptic myself. So you're and an Indian who didn't meditate? No, at no, one no. I, I saw people. You were a serious, rational guy. Absolutely. I was raised yeah. in a secular household. But I got yeah. to tell you, talking about moments uh, of bliss, uh, amongst the most elderly, the most religious folks in my family, the form of greeting actually literally translates to Have you caught a glimpse of the divine today? And the expected answer is, yes, I caught a glimpse, right? So there is this notion that you catch glimpses of the divine, right? We laughed at it as kids, you know, what did it mean? You know, I wouldn't even know if I ran into it, you know? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but then when I started doing yoga, uh, Roger Cole, great Iyengar teacher, you know, the instruction on the simplest things, like even a forward bend when you're just trying to get to your toes, is, you know, go to your edge, pull back, and wait for the moment of release. And it will come. And then when it comes, you can go further. So all these influences spread out over time. And I began to sort of recognize that interesting things happen. They arrive in moments. And if you could harvest these moments, if you could track these moments, you know, it is a measure of something. If you've never experienced these moments for months on end, years on end, maybe you're not healthy. And if there's a way in which you can figure out what is it you do that produces these moments, maybe you can learn to make more of those moments, right? So I was also playing with heart rate monitors, uh, not just things that measure your heart rate, but heart rate variation. You know, If you're into it, the intervals between left ventricular contractions uh, produce a nice time series. Uh, you can analyze it statistically. And it turns out that you can mine it endlessly uh, for, for, and correlate it with all sorts of things. Uh, so there is something very precise that I just stumbled on because there is so much literature on it. Uh, it's a very nerdy thing. It's called NNX, if that makes N -N -X? sense. NNX? Yes. It's, uh, your intervals that deviate by more than x milliseconds, and then 50, okay? Uh, you'll find lots of paper, P and N 50, and it correlates with your age, with your d disease progression, and there are cutoffs below which, you know, you ought to go to an emergency room and sort of. So but give us the bottom line. What's, what, what did you find? So what you find is if you set the right value of x, 50 for the average population, there are these little moments, and what we built is a system. This actually is our prototype device. This can be programmed to buzz every time you have one of those moments, right? This will give you your NNX moment? Yes, and we wrote an app, so this is the other big thing, you know, the arrival of the Android. It's the smallest Android platform. We it have went out at the bookstore? <laughs> <laughs> it went off the market. We were really disappointed because we had built this whole system and it suddenly went off the market. And we found out about a month ago who had bought them up. It was Google. Ah. Uh, so we felt we were on the right track. Uh, so we've since uh, uh, translated it and now it runs on the Sony watch also. But the idea is real time, feedback, tactile feedback. So as you're doing the things you do in your normal life, you recognize that there are these moments that mean something to you. It's a psychosomatic state you arrive at, right? I find that it is triggered by things you do, like uh, yoga, it's what you eat, who you talk to, you know, what stories you share, what music you listen to, right? So you discover that there are all these things. And in retrospect, sometimes, you know, if you go into the spiritual literature, you will find that they're talking exactly these things up. Right? Mm. So even though one ought to be skeptical about it, you actually find that you get ideas on what experiments to try on yourself mm. by listening to Deepak Chopra. You know. Fascinating. Are you, you told me you were going to publicize your data at some point about yourself. Have you done that? Yes, we have a website uh, aptly named bliss.calit2.net. <laughs> uh, it's actually open. You can upload your data too. And so we imagine, we fantasize, like so many others, this world where data will stream in, and we will discover uh, from looking at each other's data what worked for somebody else, right? I mean, lots of different experiments to be done. Uh, uh, you want me to share some examples of other people's experiments? Sure. Uh, uh, I have personally felt that uh, good chocolate produces moments of bliss, <laughs> right? And like, I'm probably not the only one, right? For me, I'm, I, for me it's a great avocado. <laughs> a great avocado. Yeah, See, I absolutely. want you to do that experiment yeah, and upload avocado. the data. There's something about a great, <laughs> really, really great avocado that's unmatched. Absolutely. By, See, uh, yeah. you go into raptures over a great avocado, Pretty right? much. I bet you will find... My friend Sumi Sovak <laughs> is here, who, who's a, she knows what a great avocado can do for me. So we so. did... So we did this experiment on yeah. 10 of us who are mostly involved in building this system. And sure enough, it doesn't do this for me, it does it for everybody else too, right? I must mention it was raw vegan chocolate, not sweet 
creamy stuff, right? Um, I can't get my wife to eat raw vegan chocolate, right? Yeah. But there is something in it. By the way, the act, one of the active compounds is this thing called anand amide. Anand, by the way, is Sanskrit for bliss. Mm. So, you know, I don't think we're discovering something new. Right? It is known that chocolate does induce a state of bliss. But you can experiment and find out if it does that for you or not. Here's another example, and, you know, I hope this doesn't offend anybody in the pizza business. Uh, I had a feeling that pizza doesn't induce bliss, okay? <laughs> but I haven't done the experiment on myself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I had uh, one of our young researchers who actually tried it out on himself and uploaded the data. You can go on the website, just search on pizza, and you'll find out what the results are. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I think your body tells you what food is good for you and what food isn't. And this technology basically helps you tune in so you can be at least as smart as your dog in picking out what to eat and what to avoid. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I, I, I've got time for basically, you know, two questions, if we might, right here. Let's go right in the front, if we have a, a microphone to run over. Hi, I'm John Goodman, and my question is, does one having a pacemaker which produces most of the beats mean that you can't get the data you want to see? You know, that's a fantastic question. You mm -hmm. see, uh, I didn't mention, but now that you ask, the more regular the heart beats, the less healthy it is. This was surprising. An irregular heart that dances around is a healthier heart. Okay? So now, if you're building a pacemaker, you're actually programming, depending on how often it kicks in, you're programming how your heart beats. Right? What program do they use? Right? I think we ought to be donating our own data when we are healthy. So we can download our past into our future. So we can experience so you can have variable heartbeats. You can you can experience a, a session of yoga when you can no longer do yoga mm. by triggering the same dance in your heart. So I think you can actually do a lot more adaptive pacing of your heart than traditional pacemakers might be doing. I would love to be able to do that kind of experiment, but think of all the ethical and you know safety implications. You know, I'm just so grateful. Last night I was interviewing Clifton Leaf and figuring out how we would end that in a positive way. But you take <laughs> these complicated things and make them sound so good. Um, any other last questions here? Yes, right here in the front. Hi, Jack Demers. Good morning. So the, the, uh, I'm fascinated by this measuring bliss. Now, the bliss happens in the brain. Is that where you think it happens or the mind or... Let's not get into okay, that. You have a, 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 a blissful <laughs> part of your body that does, isn't connected. So yet. I'm completely mm -hmm. convinced that the mind and body are connected, mm. right? And you can catch echoes of anything anywhere else if only you know how to listen and how to decode. So I actually think it's the heart that reveals everything. I'm not the least bit bothered by somebody scanning my brain. But you know exactly what's running through my brain by listening to my heart. So I think you ought, as engineers, to be able to pick out the signals that are easy to pick out. The vagus nerve is knocking on your chest, offering you an electrical signal. You know, why don't we just listen to that rather than build really complicated ways to sort of read into the brain, but instead figure out how to decode the signal and connect it with what's happening in the brain. So, okay. So my my question is that the if it is in the in the brain, you're uh, what is You've the theory? You've got like ten seconds. Okay. Here. What is yeah. the theory that how does it impact the heart? So it's the vagus nerve. It gets into the brain, you know. So there are different parts of the brain uh, that affect uh, your response back to the stimuli that are being gathered, the signals that are being gathered. So you see the integrated effect of the brain intervening uh, to the bodily sensations, and that's what you're able to pick up. And I think a thing like bliss is an integrative thing. It's not about one aspect over another. So I think you will, you know, when you have experienced bliss, when you experience it, you know, it's a whole body experience. It's not just in the brain. I wanted to host this morning's uh, talk as a way for Ramesh to share a bit about the extraordinary uh, genius and innovations that are happening at this institute and to thank him personally for the partnership, not only with UCSD broadly, uh, but with the Atlantic and bringing his people and ideas here. That's why I wanted to have this as a discussion rather than just a linear uh, discussion. I also am about to turn my part of this over to my great friend Ron Brownstein. Uh, and unfortunately, I've spent the last two days with you, but have to run to the airport. And I just want to say what a pleasure it's been for me uh, to be with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Steve.